Hello, this is Nelson Olmsted. One of the most popular English authors is Elizabeth Gould. And today, I'd like to bring you an excellent story she's written. It's about a woman who spent her life taking care of others and found in this service a great satisfaction. It's entitled, A Shepherd and a Shepherdess. Miss Ada Gillespie was considered by her friends to be a most fortunate woman. At the age of 55, she had excellent health, her own teeth, hardly a thread of gray in her crisp brown hair, and a comfortable little income, and freedom to go where she would and do what she liked. When she was congratulated upon her good fortune, she would stifle a yawn and incline her head in polite agreement. She had not always been congratulated. In the past, she had been pitied had even indulged in orgies of delicious self-pity. She had been the only girl in a large family of brothers and had spent 35 years in darning their socks, nursing them through the measles, packing and unpacking their trunks, and then, as they went out to India and sent home their children to her care, again darning socks, ministering to the measles, packing and unpacking, spanking and hugging, and then again more socks. On the top of all this, there had been elderly parents to look after, housekeeping to do, and servants to manage. Poor Ada, her friends would murmur. You're so terribly tied. And Miss Gillespie, who adored being tied, would smile bravely and lap up their pity like a kitten laps cream. You hardly ever have a holiday, they would mourn. And Miss Gillespie, always bored stiff by holidays, would brace her shoulders and tell them pluckily how fortunate she was that she had kept her health. And now... So gradually that she hardly noticed it, everything had come to an end. The children she had bathed and spanked were now bathing and spanking their own children. The parents who had taken up so much of her time had died. And the old home that she had labored for was sold. She was tied no longer. She was free to take a holiday for as long as she liked. She chose Bournemouth because it was the middle of winter... And she had so often during the past winters in her Cumberland home looked at pictures of the sunshine of Bournemouth and envied the untied women who went there in January. So she engaged rooms at the most expensive boarding house and traveled south first class, a thing she had never done in all her life. And the first few days were successful. But the care of others had been her life's work, and now, from long habit, she could never come into close contact with any human being without immediately wanting to bathe it, nurse it, spank it, or darn it socks. There were two children at the boarding house, and Miss Gillespie noticed that they were never quite clean behind the ears. And yet when she suggested to their mother, very politely, of course, that she should bathe them, the suggestion was not well received. Then there was an old lady who suffered from indigestion and used to describe her symptoms to Miss Gillespie every morning from 10 o'clock until 11.30. So Miss Gillespie personally interviewed the manageress and saw to it that when next the boarders were enjoying roast duck and a chocolate souffle, the old lady should have steamed sole and a sago pudding. The old lady made herself extremely, extremely unpleasant and refused to speak to Miss Gillespie for three days. So, what with one thing and another, things got a little strained at the boarding house, and Miss Gillespie came to the conclusion that she didn't like Bournemouth and couldn't possibly settle there. She decided then to pay a round of visits, for it had always been a grief to her that she saw so little of her friends. They were very pleased indeed to see her come, and even more pleased to see her go. Miss Gillespie didn't really enjoy these visits. Her fingers were always itching to put her friends' mismanaged houses and businesses to rights, and politeness forbade her to do more than give good but resented advice. So she gave up visiting and went to a London hotel, Going out one afternoon on a shopping expedition, her last before leaving London, she felt more miserable than she had in years. Tomorrow, she was going up to Scotland to see her brother James and his wife, Elaine, whom she detested. And she must get a present for Elaine, whose birthday was the day after tomorrow. Elaine was wealthy and artistic. She supposed she'd better go to an antique shop and get her a cracked piece of china or something equally useless. So... She turned away from the busy thoroughfares and went rooting about in the little back streets until she found a dingy antique shop 
whose windows had not been cleaned for months. Wrinkling her Roman nose in distaste, she opened the door and went in. No one answered the bell, and this pleased her, as it enabled her to have a good look around in peace. She poked with her umbrella at shabby, dusty articles until she gave a sudden start and stopped quite still before a china shepherd and shepherdess who stood side by side in a dusty shelf. They were the daintiest creatures she'd ever seen, and they had about them an indescribable freshness that almost made Miss Gillespie smell the clean smell of wet grass and feel the cool, soft wind that blesses the world in April. The little lady had a buttercup yellow skirt sprigged with forget-me-nots and a tight, dark blue bodice and yellow straw hat tied with blue ribbon under her innocent, pointed face. In her hand was a garlanded shepherd's crook. The little man wore a full-skirted green coat with a scarlet waistcoat and a three-cornered hat and powdered hair. He carried pipes like the pipes of pen and was bowing very gallantly to the lady. Miss Gillespie gazed and gazed, and quite suddenly she knew that she must buy this shepherd and the shepherdess. She could not, she simply could not leave them there to become cracked and neglected and coated with grime. Returning to the door, Miss Gillespie rang the bell with great determination until at last a spectacled little man with red nose and bleary eye came ambling in from the back. She pointed her umbrella to the shepherd and shepherdess and said, I'll take those. The old man, muttering to himself, wrapped up the figures, gave them to her, and, wheezing hoarsely, said, uh, Ten pounds. Miss Gillespie jumped as though she'd been shot. Although she had a nice, comfortable income, it was not sufficiently comfortable to justify her in spending ten pounds on china ornaments. And to spend ten pounds on Elaine, whom she disliked, was simply ridiculous. But if she hesitated, it was only for a moment. She soon fished ten pounds out of her capacious leather bag and departed with her package. After paying her hotel bill and her taxi to the station, she planted her ample form in front of the ticket office and demanded a ticket to Edinburgh, only to discover suddenly that she had not enough money to pay for it. The ten pounds had eaten a larger hole in her finances than she'd realized. Well, she said... I didn't want to go anyway. Without knowing exactly why, she bought a cheaper ticket to Cotswold. Traveling on a third-class ticket, she settled back and smiled idiotically. She was aware that she, the practical, strong-minded Ada Gillespie, was behaving like a complete imbecile, and it was extraordinarily refreshing. She dozed for a while and awoke with a start as the train jerked to a stop. She saw a minute platform with moss growing in the crannies, a line of purple and golden crocuses, a porter with ginger whiskies, and behind him a stretch of country lovelier than any she had ever seen before. Miss Gillespie didn't hesitate for a moment. Gripping her bag in one hand and her umbrella in the other, she started off. She liked what she saw, but she liked even better what lay before her when she arrived at the top of the hill. The valley and slope below were dotted with gray Cotswold cottages, the most delightful cottages in the world, each one apparently not built by man at all, but a part of the earth itself. But there was something even better than this. To the right, at the very crest of the hill, a tiny Cotswold manor house stood in a tangled garden. It was built of gray stone and seemed, like the cottages, to be part of the earth itself. The gate into the moss-grown drive was broken at the hinges, the garden full of weeds, and a big placard that leaned drunkenly over a wall said, For sale. Well, whoever is selling that house, said Miss Gillespie, is a fool. And at this moment, two most unpleasant gentlemen with bowler hats and red noses came down the drive. Oh, what's happened here? demanded Miss Gillespie. And one of them said, There's been an auction, ma'am. Sale of furniture and effects. But you're too late, ma'am. It's over and the stuff's gone. Well, has the house been bought? No, ma'am. Uh, no central eating. Well, how much is asked for it? Uh, Two thousand five hundred pounds. Hmm. I'll buy it. Now, Miss Gillespie was normally a very sensible woman and would not have dreamed of buying a house she could not afford without first inquiring into the condition of the drains 
but ever since she had bought the Arcadian Shepherd and Shepherdess, she had been totally irresponsible. Now she strode through the gate and up the drive, followed by the two bewildered auctioneers. She walked firmly up the steps of her house and into its cool, spacious hall. One sniff was sufficient to tell her that the house contained defective drains and dry rot. She walked down the hall, opened a door on the right, and went in. It was a white paneled drawing room with an Adams mantelpiece. In the center of the room stood a middle-aged woman in a black dress. She had been crying, and her hands, Miss Gillespie noticed, were so swollen with rheumatism that she must be nearly useless. Who are you? she asked. The woman seemed too stupefied by grief to be astonished at Miss Gillespie's entrance. She answered dully, well, I was a housekeeper, ma'am. You've been here long? Thirty years. And my daughter, my widowed daughter, was with me as a housemaid. And her ladyship let the children void with us. How many children? Five. We don't seem to know what to do now. Did her ladyship own this house? Yes, ma'am. Lady Carroll. She died very sudden-like, and her nephew sold the place. Well, I'm buying this house, and I want servants who will love it as much as I do myself. I will re-engage you and your daughter, and the children, of course, shall live with you as before. Oh, ma'am, it can't be true, what you say. Perfectly true. Now, for heaven's sakes, go and make yourself a cup of tea, and you can make me one, too, a strong mind with two lumps of sugar. The woman went, and Miss Gillespie was left alone to realize the situation in all its grimness. She was going to buy a house she couldn't afford and sorely needed repairs. She had taken upon herself the care of elderly and ailing servants and five young children. Before her stretched a period of, of struggle and poverty. She would have no holidays and no freedom. She would be absolutely tied. She would be again all that she had been so much pitied for being in the past. Yet, she had not felt so happy since the old hard-working days in Cumberland. And then, with a thrill of pleasure, she suddenly remembered her shepherd and shepherdess. Eagerly, she opened her bag and took them out and put them on the Adams mantelpiece with a looking glass behind them reflecting their charms. Instantly, she had the sense of delight that comes when beautiful things are in their right setting. The door opened and the housekeeper came in with her tea. At the sight of the shepherd and shepherdess, her eyes bulged, and the tea slopped over into the saucer. Miss Gillespie said, My good woman, what in the world's the matter? Well, the, the shepherd and the shepherdess? Well, what about them? Why, well, that's where they've always stood. You've just heard Elizabeth Googe's short story, A Shepherd and a Shepherdess, as told by Nelson Armstead. And now a closing word. I found this story recently in a book edited by Marjorie Fisher and Rolf Humphreys entitled Pause to Wonder. I hope you've enjoyed hearing it. This is Nelson Armstead saying goodbye and good reading. Nelson Armstead has presented another great short story from the world of literature. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.